this opportunity to welcome you all to the 11th session of the Committee of Experts on Union GGI MSI event for the Working Group on Geospatial Information and Services for Disasters and the Strategic Framework on Geospatial Information and Services for Disasters, Assessment, Survey, Results, and Way Forward. I will just take you into a brief background and aim and objectives. Oh, before we get there, um, the logistics arrange announcements. Um, the meeting will be recorded and uh, we will, we're asking you to please mute your microphones when you are not um, speaking and to turn off your video when uh, you're, um, well, of course, when you're not, um, when it's not in use to save the bandwidth and uh, to place any questions you have in the chat um, and we will be able to address some of these concerns during the open discussion. The background to, okay, so if we move to the background as to the reason why we're here today, um, the, the Working Group Disasters formulated a strategic framework on geospatial information and services for disasters. And it was adopted by the Committee of Experts in August 2017, and by the United Nations Economic and Social Council on the 2nd of July in 2018. Now, the framework aims to guide the member states and other stakeholders in making available and accessible all quality geospatial information and services before, during, and after disaster events. The um, aims and objectives of oh, the assessment survey the aim, sorry, the assessment survey um, is entitled UNGGM Strategic Framework on Geospatial Information and Services for Disaster Assessment Survey, and it was prepared and endorsed at the ninth session of the Committee of Experts. Now, this is a tool to assist the member states in establishing their capacity to implement the strategic framework with a view to providing further guidance and support and capacity building within the priority areas as defined by the strategic framework. And the survey consists of five chapters. Um, and we'll hear more about that later as we go along. The survey was prepared as an online um, form and it was circulated among the member states and observers in June of 2020. And of course, with a completion deadline of October 2020. The aims and the objectives um, of the side event is to engage our UNGGIM community and to seek feedback on the results of the assessment survey as presented in the background paper, which was submitted to the 11th session entitled Assessment 2020 Results. And the objective of the side event includes um, sharing the highlights and the major findings of the assessment um, displayed on the global listscape on global, regional, and also national levels um, supported by a few case studies and to highlight gaps identified um, from the assessment results and to make recommendations on the way forward. So over the next hour and about 45 minutes, um, it comes to be a learning experience as we share from various areas the contribution and the implementation of the strategic framework on geospatial information and services. So um, I think that we are at opening remarks. Um, again, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to you all. I am Michelle Edwards, um, co chair of the Working Group Disasters. I'm from Jamaica. Um, the, it gives me great pleasure uh, at this time to be able to present today the assessment survey report and the findings 
which um, was completed, of course, through the global consultation um, that was mentioned before, and share the experiences between our different countries and regions. It is built on the five priority areas for action in the strategic framework, and it is a critical baseline benchmark for member states in implementing the strategic framework. So today it is an important step for the working group as we share in this very important exchange and understanding um, the assessment 2020 results as we highlight the importance of the strategic framework on geospatial information and services for disasters and the critical lessons and findings that we will that will aid in our charting how we position to implement the strategic framework in our various member states. To our esteemed presenters, panelists and panelist moderator, we look forward to your um, valuable exchanges and experiences. And um, in closing, um, I, let me just wish for us all a very productive, engaging side event where we will share information, showcase work done, share our challenges and our uh, for more diverse backgrounds and our different circumstances as we continue to strike this delicate balance um, between living with hazards and disasters. So by way of opening remarks, um, those are my comments for the moment. Um, we will get into the... Uh, Michelle? Yes. If I could interrupt you a moment, please. So the notice regarding bandwidth is really only for persons who may be having internet connectivity challenges. So if you do not have any such challenges, we welcome you to open your open your camera and for us to see each other as we go through the session. So we do invite that. We just mentioned that just in case you may have um, bandwidth challenges that may prevent you from being able to be a part of the entire session or may cause you to drop out of the session. All right, just want to put that in. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Simone. Um, if we could just go back, Taro, to the agenda and I will just run through um, how our um, time will be spent today. So we have already done the welcome and introduction and the opening remarks. Um, we will go into the presentations and there'll be three presentations. And, um, and uh, after the presentations, then we will have the we will have the um, good practice country discussions, panel discussions, and then we will look at some gaps and next steps, and of course, um, our closing remarks. So without any further delays, let me introduce to you our first panel panelist, panel, sorry, our first presenter. And um, right, this is um, Fabrina. Did I get it correct? Fabrina DeMasso. And um, Fabrina comes to us um, from the National Mapping and Resource Information Authority. Um, she's the Director, Geospatial Information Systems Management Branch. Um, we let us welcome um, Fabrina, and Fabrina, we will receive your presentation. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. <laughs> There's echo. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening in the Philippines. I think there's an echo. Can you Could hear we me? please ask? Yes, we can hear you. Can we please ask all persons to mute your mics, please, apart from Fabrina? Okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. And Fabrina, could you kindly share your screen again? Sorry, I, I, uh, I, 
I'm sharing my screen now, but could you kindly please share your screen again? Thank you. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, we can see your screen, but no presentation. Uh, just a few sec minutes ago, we can see your sc slide. Yeah, yeah. Please try again. Thank you. I'll try again. <laughs> Yes, now I can see your slide. Thank you. Yeah, I was yeah, disconnected. I was disconnected. Can you see my slide now? Yes, but there are some echo. Are you using two device? Maybe turn off one of your device, please. Thank you. My screen is shared already. No. Your screen is shared. Thank you. Um, Fabrina, yes, so please. we have checked the listing and we're only seeing your mic open. So we're not sure if it's a case where you're using two devices and the mic on one of them is open. I'm well, sorry. well, the mic on both is open. So it's just for you to close one in terms of turning off the speaker. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So we're seeing your screen, Fabrina. Um, we you just need to go to presentation mode so that it fills the area because we're seeing the notes section. Hey, Melina, now you are uh, uh, device uh, are both muted. So could you turn on your mm -hmm. microphone or one? Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I cannot I, find it. I can. Or if you lower the uh, your speaker level, maybe uh, echo will be reduced. Thank you. Is it okay? okay. I, I still house I cannot, cannot. I'm sorry with the delay. I cannot find it. It's already off. So I was just wondering. Yeah. 
seeing a recommendation in the chat from Nick. Nick is saying to stop the echo or feedback. Um, we can mute the speaker, not the mic. So if you could mute your speaker, mm -hmm. Fabrino, maybe that will help. Can you hear me now? Yes, we're hearing yes, you. Yes, we're hearing you. Yeah, okay. So we'll just share this screen. Okay, oh, I just share the PowerPoint presentation. Yes, okay. please. I will, I will do the share at the at the presentation. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, can you see? Oh, okay. Can uh huh? Is it on now? No, not yet. No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet? Okay, wait. <laughs> it's here. Yeah, thank you, Rosa. Uh, we, we are now okay. seeing your screen. We're seeing your screen now. Okay, okay. excellent. Yeah. Just to go to... Okay, thank you. Okay, well, wonderful. Thanks, Rosa. Thank you. Okay. Sorry for the delay. Okay. That's okay, for Brina. You can... Good afternoon and good evening in the Philippines. I will be presenting to you the overview of the strategic framework on the spatial information services for disasters and its alignment to the integrated spatial information framework or IGIS. Next slide, please. First, let me give you a brief, brief background, backgrounder. Rosal, there's yeah, an echo. It's already. No. Please, please go. Uh, next screen, please. So let me first give you a big back backgrounder. The creation of the working group on disasters was triggered by a series of disasters in the past, where there was a no notable lack of the special information and services to support VRR operations. The working group was then tasked to develop a framework related to this. After several meetings, presentations in various conferences and forums, global consultations with member states and stakeholders, the framework was adopted in 2017 by the UNCCIM and endorsed by the ECOSOC in 2018. From then, the working group continued its work, including the development of an assessment tool, which really, I think, presented later by Simone. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the strategic framework then serves as the guiding policy document that brings together all stakeholders and partners involved in DRM to ensure that the necessary quality, the spatial information and services are available and accessible in a timely and coordinated way to decision making and operations before, during and after disaster. By its implementation, it is, it is expected to prevent or reduce the human, socioeconomic, and environmental risk and impacts of disasters with the specific goal of making the spatial information and services available and accessible in a timely and coordinated way across all phases of the RM. So the development of the SF GISD was guided by existing global development agenda, such as the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, among, among others, 
and other issuances and frameworks developed by the UNGTIM, such as the Global Spatial Statistical Framework and others, as you can see on the screen. Next slide, please. The framework identified five priorities for action, namely governance and policies, awareness raising and capacity building, data management, common infrastructure and services, and resource mobilization. So for governance and policy, refers to the framing, implementing, and monitoring decisions to make available and accessible all quality, the spatial information and services, across all phases of the RM. This includes activities pertaining to assessment and planning, institutional arrangements, collaboration and coordination, monitoring and evaluation. For awareness, raising, and capacity building, it, is, it refers to the improved understanding and appreciation of the spatial data and information as a vital element of DRM and the strengthening of technical and human capacity. For data management, it refers to the comprehensive methods of collecting and managing the spatial data and information. This priority for action includes specific activities related to data development, implementation of data standards, and data use guidelines. For common infrastructure and services, it focuses on the interoperability of systems and processes to allow the spatial data and information sharing among all actors in the RM. This covers the necessary capacity, such as hardware, software, network, and, and manpower, needed to process and further improve the spatial information and services. Ultimately, this is realized through the establishment of common operation center by national government. For resource mobilization, uh, it considers activities related to human resources as well as technical, financial, and other forms of logistical and administrative support required for the creation, improvement, maintenance of all the spatial information and services in order to sustain all the RRM activities. For each priority action, for action, the framework identified the activities that should be implemented at the local, national, regional, and global level. The UNGIM formulated another framework, which is the Integrated the Spatial Information Framework, or IGIF. So the IGIF is an overarching strategic policy and guide for developing and strengthening the spatial information system capability. It is co composed of three related documents. The overarching strategic framework adopted in 2018, and the implementation guide in 2020 and the country level action plan which will be developed by the member states so having said that the question now is is the, is the strategic framework on the spatial information and services for disaster is still relevant so how are these two bodies works related They're related by comparing both frameworks in terms of vision. In terms of a scope and purpose. And in terms of goal. Though structured differently, the high level intents of each are aligned. That is harnessing the spatial information and services in support of sustainable development, the IGIS, and DRM, 
the strategic framework for these actors. So looking further, as mentioned earlier, the strategic framework for the spatial information services has five priorities, while IGIF identified nine strategic pathways that member states can consider. The working group on disasters briefly looked at the alignment of these priorities for action and the strategic pathways. Next slide, please. So here it shows which priority for action exhibit strong linkage or inferred linkage with its IGIF strategic pathway. Governance and policies and awareness raising and capacity building action show strong linkage with IGIF, except in strategic pathway relating to finance. We can say the same for the other priorities for action with a few inferred linkages. The working group is confident of the strong alignment between the two frameworks. While, this, while the strategic framework presents clear actions for consideration in its implementation, it is not in itself an action plan. So the IGIF can be referenced as a means to develop a viable action plan for the implementation of the SFGIS. Again, we reiterate the call for member states and DRM stakeholders to act now. So that ends my presentation. Thank you and sorry for the delay. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Fabriba. And um, you, although we had a slight delay in starting, we thank you for your presentation and the overview of the strategic framework and the um, IGIF, um, the, the alignment, the strong linkages between both. Um, thank you again. We will move to our second presentation. And uh, it gives me pleasure to welcome uh, Miss Simone Lloyd. Um, she is the lead of Task Group A and C, the GIS professional. Um, she is a member of the right task group lead A and C for the UNGGIM um, disasters. She's a senior GIS manager and trainer at the National Spatial Data Management Branch um, here in Jamaica, and um, which is a part of the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment, and Climate Change, um, and Climate Change here in Jamaica. Um, so Simone, thank you. And we will receive your presentation now. Thank you very much, Michelle. Hello, everyone. Tara, switching over from you. Yes, sure. OK, good. So we are here to present to you the initial findings from the strategic frameworks assessment survey which was administered in 2020 as Michelle would have alluded to earlier and so we were going through what were the main findings from the survey what were gaps that were identified in addition to looking in terms of charting our way forward. So my presentation will take the following format providing a quick background although Michelle and um, Fabina has done such a good job where that is concerned. Um, the methodology, so I'll delve more into the methodology. Who were the survey distributors? What was the survey at the response averages between government versus non-government respondents? Um, the regional perspective, so looking at the analysis results per region, 
also looking at the findings and gaps and with that narrowing down to the findings, the recommendations, the way forward with respect to this document. So Michelle would have carried us through the background as to why it is that the working group would have been developed, which would have been to spearhead the development of this framework and its implementation. And so with that, the fact that the assessment survey which was developed, the framework which was developed and the assessment survey which would have been under the leadership of the Philippines and Jamaica as the co-chairs, the previous co-chairs. And so with that, we now have a document that we've been working with and we now have a assessment survey to assist with the whole monitoring and tracking process with regards to um, the implementation. So the framework would have been developed to support the Sendai framework, framework on disaster risk reduction. And the Sendai framework, of course, looks at diminishing disaster risks and losses, the loss of lives, livelihoods he and health in the economic, physical, social, cultural and environmental assets of persons, all of us, our businesses, our communities and our countries. So the strategic framework on geospatial information and services for disasters is directly aligned with that framework. And so with that, um, moving towards ensuring that the use of geospatial information and services, in addition to relevant statistical information, that they are the that member states are better able to understand, formulate policies and manage risks that are associated with the impact of disasters. And Fabrina would have spoken to the importance of that before, during and after disaster events. And so with that, we're here with respect to looking at the results of this assessment instrument, which would have been administered latter part of June to the beginning of October last year to get the feedback from member states. So who were the contributors? So here is a listing, government organizations from member states who would have contributed, the long listing that is here, in addition to government organizations from non-member states, um, Cook Islands as a, as a, as a non-member state, in addition to non-governmental organizations. So these would have been the entire listing in terms of contributors. Now the breakdown per region would be as follows. So we're seeing the breakdown within the Americas, within Africa who responded. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have any submissions from the Arab states. We did also from Asian Pacific, also from Europe. So this would have been the document, the online version in terms of the survey, online survey, in addition to the digital version in terms of the, the document that could be filled and submitted separately. Some member states chose to fill it in separately, different from actually completing the online survey. So both versions would have been analyzed. Fabrina would have done a very good job of highlighting the five priority areas for action of this survey. And with that, the fact that for this for the framework, it would be necessary for each of these priority areas to have a rating scale which was developed. And where this rating scale is concerned, it would have started from a category of one up to a category of five. One being um, indicated by respondents who were unaware of a particular initiative under governance and policies or whichever other priority era. Um, so they're not unaware of it or of its implementation within their country. And so they would indicate one. Different from persons indicating that the initiative definitely has not commenced as yet within their country or that it has commenced, which would be three, but they still have major tasks that they still need to undertake. Category four would speak to the initiative being significantly implemented and is currently ongoing, but there are still some minor tasks that need to be executed. Whereas category five would speak to the initiative being fully implemented in the country. And so with that, they should be realizing significantly the benefits of its implementation. So where our contributors are concerned, we are very appreciative 
of the time that would have been taken by all our contributors from the member states, from the other entities who would have contributed to the process, because we know it's a bit lengthy in terms of the listing of questions because of how robust it is. And so we really um, appreciate the time that would have been taken to complete it and to provide all the relevant documentation to support the responses that were provided. So with this, the majority, of course, would have been government entities. And we can see here that Asia and the Pacific would have been the largest in terms of respondents, followed by Europe and the Americas, Africa being the lowest in terms of respondents to the survey, and we did not have any respondents from the Arab states. So 43 responses from member states. Now, given the low, the low responses from Africa, it posed a challenge. So we were disappointed that we were not able that when the working group met and discussed initially with respect to when we looked at the initial um, results in terms of who were the persons who contributed in terms of member states. It was a working group decision to proceed with the three primary regions that completed the survey in terms of sufficient quantities of responses that would then result in us being able to adequately analyze and present findings. All right. So based on that, um, it was the decision was made to not analyze the Afri the, res the responses from the African states. So that is one of the things that we are going to discuss at the end, whether we would like, whether we think it is wise to revisit that and to pursue the analysis of those. So these are the areas. There are 38 broken down areas for the five priorities in terms of questions that were asked in the survey. Now, from that, we would have identified 19 core areas or questions of which we thought would have been best to really take time in terms of analyzing and presenting those results. These would have been core areas that would significantly influence the other the other um, era, sub areas within the particular priority era. And so these were the areas that were identified for priority A, political support, financial support, champion identified, monitoring and evaluation program implemented to track the country's progress. So those were the areas for priority A, which looks at governance, right, and policy. For priority B, which looks at awareness raising, <clears throat> We targeted geospatial information and services that they are translated into easily understood strategies and tools, in addition to GI and services being integrated into academic programs, um, DRM related researches using geospatial information and services that these are initiated and they are managed, and also to ensure that training programs on the use of GI and services that these are heavily promoted for development and for implementation. Priority C, which focuses on data management, would then we would then have focused on these areas that of the existence of common and accessible database systems, national and local DRM plans include hazard, vulnerability, and also disaster risk assessment maps. A common data contact database being established for national and local emergency responders, also having data management guidelines that are incorporated. Yes, with key factors that would drive that. For priority D, we would have looked at infrastructure. So a common infrastructure and facility um, that would be established usually through a national operations center. Um, are there backup facilities that are available online and offline to access geospatial data? Additionally, what of the interoperability of all systems and processes in disaster risk management organizations? And then finally, E, with respect to resource mobilization, are DRM organizations sensitized on the necessity of funding geospatial information and services for their DRM initiatives? Is it a case whereby the private sector is encouraged to invest in GI and services? And is funding supported easily? And is it easily accessible to support the implementation of all five priority areas? So when we looked at the analysis, the results based on comparison for each region, uh, the government versus the non-government respondents, we found that the respondents from non-government, that their responses were higher, and in some cases, significantly higher than that of the government entities. And so with that, 
given the fact that we need a national perspective for each member state, the decision was made to primarily focus on the government sector in terms of their responses. So we can see based on these frequency polygons that it would have been higher in terms of the respondent responses from non-government versus government, government being the orange line. So what would have been the regional perspective? Importantly, it is good to note that based on how the questions are phrased, it really at times lends itself in terms of subjectivity. And so in terms of being able to quantify the results, sometimes that posed a challenge with regards to the scores. So notwithstanding that, we were able to identify a number of trends within the five, um, the five priority areas and the five priority areas would have formed the five chapters or sections of the survey. And so we would have proceeded with that on a global level in terms of assessment and also on a regional level. So for priority A, which focuses on governance and policies. So we would have found that within this case scenario, 12% overall of the respondents would have indicated that they have gotten, they've achieved category five in terms of getting full support and they have um, got political support being prime and it's fully implemented. So that is 12% overall. Per region, we can see that it varies. So for the Americas, it was 7%, for Asia, 18%, for Europe also, it was 18%, right? What is encouraging is that it was not 0% for any of the regions. So that is very encouraging. So it's just in terms of how can we strategize and how can we move forward in terms of really building consensus and building um, buildings the support of government with respect to really spearheading and pushing and propelling the use of geospatial information and services to aid DRM efforts. For financial support, we found that 7% um, globally spoke to a fact, spoke to having category five with respect to full implementation. And interestingly, for the Americas, 33% indicated that they have um, they have achieved category five with respect to financial support, nine for Asia and 10, 17 for Europe. Interestingly for Asia, it was never a case whereby there wasn't any particular member state or who would have indicated not being aware of the initiative being implemented. For all, it would have been a case whereby um, there was there is awareness and implementation is at some stage, apart from nine of which we're seeing that um, there is a challenge where that is concerned. So given the paradigm that is here, 39% at the global level indicated intermediate to advanced implementation with respect to achieving financial support, full financial support. For champion identified, 16% would have indicated globally that they have identified a champion that is fully implemented, someone who's going to be sparing um, the implementation process with regards to GIS, um, the strategic framework overall. Uh, for Asia, there were 18% in terms of achieving category five, 33 for the Americas, 25% for Europe, right? Now with that, we're seeing that for Asia, all the respondents have actually are at, whether it be a beginner, an intermediate or an advanced with respect to implementation. However, for the Americas and for Europe, there is a quantity of persons there who are who are either not aware of the initiative or who have not commenced. The good thing is that at least 75% in both cases are have started implementation and are at whether it be beginner, intermediate or advanced in terms of their stage with regards to implementation. For monitoring and evaluation, we see that for each of for globally, <clears throat> globally we're seeing that category three would have been the prime for each of the priority areas. And this would have ranged from 26 upwards to 36. So that would have been prime in terms of the responses. So in a lot of cases, yes, it is a case whereby um, the whatever initiative it is for each of the party areas, it has commenced, 
but there's still a lot of work to be done. So that is a global find. The Americas find directly aligned to the global find in terms of category three with respect to commencement and with that, that there are still areas that need to be worked on. For Asia, we would have seen a change where that is concerned with yes, category three is prime, but also category four is significant with respect to a monitoring and evaluation program um, being, being at category four in terms of more advanced, intermediate to more advanced with respect to responses. For Europe, we find it interesting that there is a significant in terms of the responses who would have indicated not being aware as to whether there is a monitoring and evaluation program that is being implemented within the particular member state. So they would have recorded one category one for all the priority areas would have seen a range from 42 upwards to 50% in terms of respondents indicating that. Importantly also, we're seeing an increase in the quantity of respondents who would have also indicated that they are at a category four or a category five um, with respect to their level of implementation. So they're more intermediate to advanced in terms of having a monitoring and evaluation program that is really tracking their conscious progress. For category B, awareness raising and capacity building, we're seeing that geospatial information and services, are they being translated into easily understood strategies? And 14% of the global respondents would have indicated yes, in terms of full implementation where that is concerned, whereas in Asia, it would have been a significant 37%, which is very high um, in comparison to the other regions who would have indicated eight for Europe and 7% for um, the Americas. With that, in all cases, we're seeing that there is some level of unawareness as to whether the initiative is being implemented within their country. With regards to the, the integration of geospatial information and services within academic programs, globally, 14% would have indicated that, yes, this is fully implemented within their member state. Um, for Asia, a significant 37% would have confirmed the rating of five, 8% um, for Europe, 20 and, and no, no category five for the Americas. Interestingly and importantly, in all of these cases, we're seeing that there is a significant um, uptake in terms of member states who have started implementation. So whether they're at the beginner, intermediate or advanced stage with regards to that. However, in Europe's case, in this case, we're seeing that 50 percent are either, sorry, not aware of the program being implemented or have not commenced as yet. For DRM related researches using geospatial information and services and that these are initiated and that yes they are managed. 14% indicated category 5 so full implementation that yes in these researches we are integrating geospatial information and services um, in a, a high 36% for Asia with respect to that uh, high a low of 8% for Europe and a non-existence of category 5 for the Americas. With the Americas, however, there's a significant uptake in terms of beginner to intermediate stage with regards to its implementation. And we're seeing for all cases, the fact that uh, category three in terms of beginner stage is significant. Training programs that use geospatial information and services. So 12% are at category five, 27% um, for Asia. Yes, they, there are training programs that do that. Um, 8% for Europe, none in terms of category five for the Americas. Interestingly, for the Americas, we would have a 40% who have not commenced the activity, um, but all are aware of the activity. However, for Europe, there is a percentage quarter of the respondents indicating that they're not aware of the initiative being in existence. Priority C, which looks at data management, one of the key areas is looking at the existence of a common and accessible database. So a database that has all our respondents, our emergency respondents, does that exist? So 12, 19%, sorry, would have indicated globally that they have achieved full in terms of implementation. 13% for the Americas would have achieved full implementation, category five, 25% for Europe, 27% for Asia. All are at some stage of 
of um, implementation. However, for Europe, we're seeing a 25% um, increase, well, a 25% recorded amount who have indicated they're not aware of the initiative being in existence, and globally, that would indicate a 10%. National, prior, national and local disaster risk management plans, that these include hazard vulnerability and disaster risk assessment maps. Now with that, we would see a 19% globally that would have indicated, yes, they have achieved full, implement, full implementation at category five. On the other hand, for Asia, we're seeing a very high 46% indicating that yes, they have these national and local DRM plans and that they do integrate hazard vulnerability and disaster risk assessment. Now, for, um, for the Americas, a low of 7% at, at category five, and for Europe, 17% for category five. For Asia, apart from a 9%, all others are at some stage with regards to implementation. 13% have not started in the Americas, NIVA has 17, 23% for Europe. Persons who are unaware or who have not started. A common database of national and local emergency responders. So does this exist? Um, with that, we're seeing a 21% globally that yes, this does exist and is being fully implemented at category five. Um, for the Americas, 20%. For Europe, a high of 33%. For Asia, 18%. For Asia, none, none of the respondents did not um, indicated being unaware. For Europe and for for Europe and for Asia, um, the Americas, however, we're seeing some indication of that. Right. So full. So the level in terms of level at which uh, member states are at with respect to implementation varies from beginning beginner to advance with a significant quantity for each region being at category three. So they have commenced and are progressing. Now data management guidelines that these incorporate key factors. 7% would have indicated globally that yes, um, they are at category five with respect to full implementation of having these data management guidelines. And yes, they do incorporate various key factors. Now within the Americas, uh, we, would, we did not receive any feedback with respect to category five, but a high of 33 for category four, which is an intermediate intermediate stage with respect to its implementation. 27% um, for Asia, 33% for Europe, and Europe indicating at 8%, so a bit higher than the global average with respect to responses. Part D on common infrastructure and services. So, do these exist? Do these common infrastructures exist? Um, and in particular, is there a national operation center? Is this established? So 23% would have indicated category five in, with respect to full implementation. And we would have found that in a lot of cases, member states would have had these um, national operation centers established from before the strategic framework would have come into being. And so the strategic framework helps in terms of helping to um, make their operations sent more robust in terms of approach and the whole use of geospatial information and services. 13% uh, for the Americas indicating category five, 46%, which is high, indicating being at a beginner stage and they have made progress, but a lot of work is needing to be done. 64% um, um, within, within um, Asia indicating that, that they're in, at the intermediate state versus 18% who are at category five. 50%, a very high of 50% in Europe, have indicated being at category five in terms of being advanced. So double the global average for Europe with respect to category five. Do backup facilities exist? Are these online and offline? Um, where access is provided to geospatial data. So the global average speaks to 21% indicating category five. And with that, we have 36% in Asia being above that average, indicating yes for full implementation, 7% in the Americas, 33% in Europe. Interoperability of all systems and processes, is this the case? Um, yes, it is, and it varies throughout 9% in, um, 9% being the case globally, 7% in Americas, 8% Europe, 
and Asia 18 percent. And for category three, it e E, sorry, in terms of resource mobilization, we would see a similar pattern with respect to the distribution where the quantities are concerned, at a high of 12% globally, and 7% Americas, 18% Asia, and 20 thing for Europe. Private sector encouragement, a low of 8% in terms of um, full implementation, 7 for the Americas, 10 for Asia, um, nine for you with respect to category five, and we're seeing a significant increase in terms of member states who have not commenced or who are unaware of the initiative, starting in particular in the case of Europe and also in the Americas. And funding, funding we found was a major area of concern, 5% um, indicating category five, and here we had a number of member states in particular in Europe indicating haven't commenced or are at or are unaware of the initiative. So with that, a number of gaps were found with respect to the analysis that was undertaken. Of course, the stage of the member states would vary and the level of implementation would vary. And based on all that I would have gone through with you, you would have seen in terms of what is happening, where the priorities are concerned. So I will through that. Um, in terms of gaps, there are some gaps that were identified. So leveraging geospatial data and related infrastructures. Challenges being experienced where that is concerned, lack of sufficient financial resources, and um, what of the communication channels, and um, relying on personal network contacts rather than institutional arrangements, um, the lack of or outdated DRM laws and policies, also a ad hoc, diffuse, intermittent, not systemized um, approach in terms of uh, roadmap. Yes, there's a sense of national disaster committees, which is good, but there are some gaps in terms of collaboration and so provides an opportunity where that is concerned. Um, different from the fact that mutual learning and exchange where good practices will be key moving forward and the need for synergies and collaboration. Um, and in particular, between the national disaster agencies and the national geospatial entities of, or of member states, in addition to the fact that we need to get feedback from member states in terms of how their experience was filling out the survey, were there any challenges that they experienced and how it is that we can move towards improving the survey. And with that, looking at how often it is that the working group should proceed in terms of administering this survey to facilitate the monitoring and the tracking. So with that, we invite we invite all persons within the meeting and of course the the background paper in terms of being able to go through it and provide feedback over time post 11 session to see how it is that we can improve on the document a first draft has been submitted so how can we improve on the document moving forward and in particular with respect to africa and asia is it a case where for africa we should pursue the five responses in terms of analyzing those should we open it up back and invite additional african member states to respond and with that then being able to analyze all of the responses to have at least 10 responses from them and to possibly see how much we can reach out to asia and see the sorry not asia the arab states to see if they would be willing to respond to the survey so that we can also provide analysis to those areas. Additionally, as indicated before, 19 of the 38 areas were targeted. And so with that, should the working group pursue, pursue the analysis of the additional areas to see what were the findings where that is concerned and with that provide a second edition of the background paper. Right. And so I thank you. Sorry for taking so long. I tried to go through as quickly as I could. Over to you, Michelle. Uh, thank you very much, Simone. <clears throat> it's OK that you've taken a little more time. That's all right. The presentation was very important. And we just want to thank you for the comprehensive examination of and presentation of the findings of the survey. And of course, um, the call for persons to review and provide feedback over time so that we can, um, you know, improve on what is presented here already. So thank you very much, Simone. We're going to move to the third presentation. And um, I want to welcome Mr. Nick McWilliam. Um, Nick 
is a volunteer, a GIS volunteer with Map Action. He has over 15 years of experience um, involving emergency response, um, preparedness and capacity building. And he works with the British Antarctic Survey as a data analyst. Thank you very much, Nick, for your presentation. Yes, hello everybody. And um, can I just get confirmation from somebody, please, that you can hear me and see my PowerPoint screen, please? Uh, if I may, uh, Nick, I have two grey box in your slide, so maybe could you uh, offer uh, two box uh, in your uh, computer? Thank you. So, sorry, Taro, can, can you say that again, please? Uh, when you share your slide, I saw two grey box to small square in your slide or uh, which disturb your presentation. I think there are some uh, some uh, windows. Uh, so okay. please try to share your screen again. Okay? Thank you. Yes, I'll um, I'll just make one adjustment. And hope it works better now. Is that is that working well now? Perfect. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Sorry about that. And um, yes, um, first of all, thank you for the welcome, everybody, and to the organisers for inviting me. And um, I'm a newcomer to this group, so please forgive my oversights. But I hope this um, this case study is interesting and relevant to the to the discussion of this working group. <clears throat> so. For those who don't know, Map Action is a UK-based NGO that uses geographic information <clears throat> to support humanitarian action, and that includes um, disaster response, preparedness, and capacity building. And um, since the prospect of COVID vaccines became a reality during last year, rather than a distant hope, we've been keen to support vaccine rollout in low and middle income, uh, we've seen it as a good opportunity for using geograph geographic information. So in this presentation, I'll quickly go over the context that we're working in, and I'll look at the problem that we addressed, the solution that we've come up with, and look at how this ties in possibly to the work of, of this um, working group and the framework. <clears throat> so in terms of context, we we already know that geographic information is useful for not just COVID vaccine, but any immunization program. <clears throat> and this is this is already well established and published by UNICEF and WHO. And I've listed some of the examples of data layers and data sets that can be useful. Um, demographics, pu public health, infrastructure, health facilities, and transport and logistics. And um, in terms of where we are with vaccine rollout, um, if you look at these projected vaccines that are going to be delivered under the COVAX scheme, that whereby recipient countries, low and, low and middle income countries, receive free vaccines paid for by high income countries, we can see lots more vaccines are due to arrive in the second half of this year and during next year. Um, having said that, there are big concerns about what's called the absorptive capacity of countries to actually um, not just receive these vaccines at the airport, but to deliver them um, to people's arms in cities and villages and in rural settings. So the big challenges here that we've already experienced with quite low numbers of vaccines. And um, with my actions work, we received funding to undertake a pilot project. We focused on South Sudan, and our aim was to build a portfolio of geographic data sets that was immediately useful to practitioners working on vaccine delivery and uh, planning and delivery. <clears throat> we wanted to be ready for country needs to arise, particularly through the UNICEF WHO framework. And we wanted learning from this project to inform other efforts in other countries. And I should note that we we worked with a partnership of organizations and some we were able to offer grants to and others, Esri and Mapbox, were supporting in kind and with services. 
So we're grateful to all of our partners. Now, in putting together our portfolio of data, I'd like to um, show why did I'd like to ask why did we focus on data? And this is mainly for the benefit of this group because we're interested in, in geographic information. In one way or another, I expect everyone's familiar with this sort of flow diagram of how data relates to outcomes. <clears throat> um, and I think it's been very clear to me when I've seen all the work of the various agencies involved in this, in, Co in COVAX and vaccine delivery, um, about 75% of the solutions I've seen offered rely on existing geographic data. So we start at the top with what we might consider to be the outcome, vaccine planning and delivery, um, and the set of use cases around that. Um, all the, the questions that we ask, who's going to be vaccinated? How many vaccinations will be needed? Where will they, where do we need them to be? <clears throat> when do we need them to be there before they expire or as part of a cold chain plan and so on? In supporting these, we've got a lot of geographic tools, all the GIS tools, analyses and so on that we're familiar with, and all of these underpinned by data. So the, the area that we realised was actually a bottleneck was around this um, connection between the data and the and people use it, people's use of data. And um, just to emphasise, I'm not talking about data availability. It's more to do with usability. So I'll zoom in on this bottom area. How how did data so data sources data sets become useful? So zooming in on that, a slightly more involved diagram. And um, if we start at the top. Um, and imagine that you are a health officer in the government of South Sudan and you're saying how many vaccines do each of my districts need? That, that in a sense is our use case and maybe we just want three data sets, the population over 55, the health catchment areas and the locations of health facilities within those catchment areas. And with that data we can estimate the number of vaccines needed number of doses needed. <clears throat> but in order to get those data, um, we, go to a we go to regular data sources, and it may be a national mapping agency, it may be a platform like Humanitarian Data Exchange, HDX, and of course there are many others. And we have to start looking for those data sets. And we probably find the four or five different population data sets available, depending on when the last census was taken um, and what projections are used and what modelling techniques were used and so on. Likewise with health catchment areas, there are different ways of representing that. So again, we need to look at them all, we need to assess them, quality control them, choose most relevant ones. Um, so we actually have to do a lot of work to prepare data before we can start using it. And I've listed some other um, data preparation tasks. And again, I think all of us as GIS professionals will be all too familiar with the amount of work that goes into data preparation. And what we identified here, and we've seen time and time again in Map Action's experience, that this data preparation time exposes a lot of other problems from an organisational point of view. Um, it presents capacity barriers. We need capacity to do all these steps. It takes time. As I'll show you in the next slide, it holds things up because of that time and in an emergency, in a disaster response, that time is valuable. It means each agency trying to use the data is duplicating the effort and it means that we're liable to actually start using different data sets as each agency does their own work, does their own processing. Um, so just as an example of this, uh, I'll just tell you about uh, analysis of accessibility to vaccination centres in Southeast Asia, done by the Health Geolab Collaborative, um, was a really good piece of analysis. And if you look at that timeline on the right, the red bit is the time they spent on data preparation, and the blue bit is the time they spent doing what they wanted to do, which was the analysis of accessibility. So you can see there was a three month, two and a half, three month delay and they spent 70 to 80% of their project time 
um, preparing data. So you multiply that by all the agencies using data in a disaster response or in a pandemic response, and you can see there's actually a big, um, a big waste of time and effort there and a potential for saving. So this is where we wanted to see what we could do. And um, what we did was, was a, a data package that we've called the Integrated Humanitarian Data Package. Um, it's available for downloads, and I can post these links in the chat when I'm finished. Um, and it's not just data. I'll, I'll try and explain a bit more about what it is, what the concept is. Um, I've described it as a consistent, accessible and open set of geographic data. It's built around use cases, in this case, vaccine support, but it could be any particular use case. Um, in South Sudan, and we're trying to make it adaptable to the different geographies. It could be a country or a smaller or bigger locality, um, and also adaptable to different use cases and other humanitarian needs. So it's not just a one-off, but it's a flexible model for packaging data. What does it involve? Um, we're selecting data that's relevant. We're cleaning it, finding the most, you know, the most relevant layers. We're enriching it, for example, with P codes, um, or any other enrichment that's, that will help the use case. Um, there's a consistent data model within the package, like layer names and field names. I should note we're not advocating for uh, um, um, a standard data model. This data model is purely designed within the, within the data package for the use case, and we're providing a consistent set of metadata and documentation for each layer. What does it actually look like in a, at a technical level? It's wrapped as a geo package um, database and it contains this, these main elements. Um, I won't go through them all individually, but you can see as well as data, there are other tools designed to make it useful and accessible um, to a range of users, whatever environments they're using. In the in the public health context, we might be looking at um, standard health systems like DHIS2 and, and others that are in use. Um, in terms of its benefits, I think I've alluded to the problems before, but these are the, the benefits that we, that, we, that we see arising from the package. Um, it's ready when needed, it's adaptable to different use cases, scalable to different geographies, it's relevant. Um, a key thing is that it's accessible. Um, it means geographic data is usable by practitioners. Um, say an epidemiologist or uh, a search and rescue coordinator, rather than needing more GIS expertise in between. The value comes from reducing duplication. Um, and as I mentioned, this commonality idea stopping divergent data sets within, a, within the same operational framework. Um, if we're using common data sets, they're much more interoperable, interrelatable. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, we base this on the published needs for vaccination planning. Our next phase that we've just received funding for is to go to South Sudan to talk to the Ministry of Health as the main user and UNICEF, which is their, the main partner in vaccine rollout, as well as other um, other public health organisations like NGOs. And we're also talking to the National Bureau of Statistics as the national mapping agency in South Sudan, um, as the as the authority on on the national geographic data sets. Just to to conclude on that. Um, some of the themes that I've drawn out that I think might be relevant in the context of this working group. This idea of linking data sets to use cases, how will they be used in a disaster context? And um, I'm not saying all data sets must be driven by use cases, but it's always useful in producing a data set that we know we're meeting a need. <clears throat> and also to look at the needs and see that we are producing the right data sets. Consider data usability as well as availability. 
sometimes it's almost a problem that too much data is available. Um, whereas more focus on usability, we found, makes data much more applicable and relevant in an emergency context. Um, uh, data, Nick? Yes, please. Nick? Right. I, um, I am just looking at the time and we still have a panel presentation um, section to come. So I'm just wondering if you could just, I could just give you a minute to just wrap up okay. and I okay. can move into the next. Well, session. I'm very happy to stop there actually, because you can see my final concluding comments. Um, so yes, and the, I, I'll just emphasize this last one um, to connect with national mapping agencies and government agencies like MOH, as I mentioned before. Yes, yeah, so, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and uh, thank you again for the opportunity and I'll, I'll pass back to the organizers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Nick, for your presentation. It was really informative and congratulations on the work that you're doing. I will now hand over to our panel moderator, uh, Ms. Dr. Naru, Naru Sabo. And uh, Dr. Sabo is the Director General in Charge of Innovations at Canada, Center of Mapping and Earth Observation and um, Center of Excellence for Geomat Geomatics Mapping and Earth Observation. Dr. Sabu, um, you can introduce your panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have around 25 minutes behind our agenda, so I will try to go very uh, fast. So we have uh, five pan panel uh, panelists. As the first one, I will I will start by introducing you know our panelists. Uh, the first panelist is uh, uh, Mr. Hidonori Fujirima. Uh, he's a plan planning director of Geospatial Information Department uh, of Geospatial Information Authority of Japan. He is also the lead of the task group B of UNGGIM working group uh, for disasters. The second panelist is uh, Alan Mills. Uh, he is a preparedness coordinator and he works to prepare humanitarian landscape for mapping information management for response, working with international agencies, countries, regional agencies, and civil society. He participated to many emergencies. The next panelist is Chung Hung Chang. Uh, she is the head of emergency engineer department of Sichuan Geomatics Center for the China's Ministry of Natural Resources. The next panelist is uh, Maria Correa at uh, the National Administrative Department of Statistics of Colombia. And the last one, I don't know, he's a, I, uh, he's a Sonodama Gaksha. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, on other engagement, he cannot join us today. Sorry for that. Okay, uh, so we have uh, uh, four panel panelists. Uh, so to start, I will ask each panelist to deliver a one minute introductory statement. Uh, I will start with uh, Mr. Fujimori. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sabo, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good uh, evening, everyone. So, yes, I would like to shortly introduce uh, my position. Uh, yes, at first, I would like to share with you uh, some of my experience uh, with from working with uh, our task group, B, group B uh, colleagues. And what I found is that uh, we have a quite different perspectives or different strategy in implementing uh, our strategic framework. And I think uh, that is a really difficult part uh, in thinking about collaboration uh, between uh, us. But I think uh, simultaneously, uh, this is a great opportunity uh, to uh, try to collaborate, to try to discuss with what we can do. And uh, so I agree, I think that uh, it is uh, really difficult to find a shared perspective, but uh, First, I would like to share our uh, perspective uh, in uh, three points. First of all, uh, it's about the purpose. I think it is really 
important to define a clear purpose. I don't think our purpose uh, in this framework is not uh, promoting the GIS itself or uh, some other, but uh, our purpose is we think uh, we promote uh, the situational awareness uh, in disaster situation. And the second thing, uh, yes, it's about the vision. We actually have an inclusive and human-centered vision. And uh, we do not think that uh, the concept of something like platform, geoportal, hub, or even special data infrastructure, uh, not, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, actually not uh, for our vision, uh, because uh, it's just an implementation method. So regarding our vision, yes, we do have uh, an increasing human-centered vision, but uh, it was a little bit too hard to translate by ourselves. But uh, in this uh, IgG IM session, I found re really good document titled Towards a Sustainable Geospatial Ecosystem Beyond SDIs, written by Dr. Selena Kutze, actually Professor uh, Selena, and other, uh, others. I think uh, this document is really relevant, and I really found that uh, this concept, uh, sustainable geospatial ecosystem, is quite similar to our vision, uh, which is, uh, yes, uh, really, uh, yeah, try to see uh, the whole picture uh, of the use or production of the geospatial information. So we think that uh, it is really important to see the whole geospatial ecosystem as a big picture, and that is the second thing. And the last thing uh, is about uh, our mission as our organization, uh, which is a mapping agency of Japan. It's our strategy, or sorry, uh, our advantage actually, advantage or opportunity uh, is that we are doing our operation in normal time and also in a disaster situation. I think uh, it is really necessary to, uh, yes, make use of this opportunity so that uh, we have more uh, wider situation and awareness uh, to the people who uh, need disaster information. Uh, that concludes my uh, comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Alain Mills. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I able to share my screen here? Let me just check. You should be able to see this now. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And um, I just want to make a few points because I'm really the maverick on this panel that I'm not part of a government organization that, as Nick was explaining about Map Action's role in this. And I want to make a couple of points about I see how important the uh, assessment of the implementation of the strategic framework has been this year. I hope we don't get siloed into just thinking about having data preparation for national governments, but I share that we are have a much wider GI landscape in everybody's countries at a national, local, but then also regional and international level. And there are all these different people who are either providing data or technological support, remote sensing uh, providers. We have data curators, which is where a lot of us are, are sitting in terms of either having the portals and the, the data availability that we discuss within this working group, but also the storytellers who are actually shaping that data and then passing it on to end users who are not experts in GI, uh, but need to understand uh, what we are doing with the, the geographical information so that they can make good decisions. And I think we don't participate at the moment very much with the end users of that information. And I think we should be thinking about that for future iterations of this. And the other big point, there's a lot of points on here that you can read in detail later on. But the other thing I want to make sure that we have that situational awareness of how the humanitarian landscape is changing. We are seeing this year, particularly the increasing frequency, intensity, and the multidimensionality of events that's going on, particularly impacted by climate change. And we're having severe funding challenges, particularly since COVID. But humanitarian action itself is evolving. And as well as the traditional dis disaster risk reduction and risk profiling and the response mapping, things like anticipatory action, where you put aid in place before a disaster happens, we need to use our GI tools to uh, work on that. 
as well as communicating with communities and combating fake news and actually transmitting GI information down to those people who are affected. So there's a bunch of different things that I can get into into the discussion about how we can apply GI to this later on. But given the short time, I'll hand back to the uh, moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, next, uh, Chung Chang. Please, you have the microphone. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Saba. Hello, everyone. And this is Chen Hongzhen from Sichuan Dramatic Center. Ministry of Natural Resources of China, thank Secretary of the UN Jijama Working Group on Disasters for having me in this panel discussion. To implement the strategic framework, I think that government support is one of the most important priorities for actions. Good policies can effectively guarantee the investment both in GIS and DRM. Secondly, I think it is necessary to strengthen the role and responsibilities of GIS in disaster risk management and regard the GIS team as an important emergency support force. Making emergency plans and establishing a joint response mechanism with emergency management departments will help improve the efficiency of disaster response. In addition, in order to better promote high quality geospatial information data in DRM application, it is necessary to establish a data sharing mechanism, improve network transmission and data storage security, and strengthen the integration or integration of GIS data with statistical, geological, meteorological, environmental, and the other industri industry semantic data. And this is my humble opinion on the implementation of the five priorities for actions. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Next panelist, uh, Maria Correa, over you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Maria Correa, and on behalf of the Colombian National Statistical Office, DANE for its acronym in Spanish, I thank you for this invitation to share the Colombian experience on the implementation of this strategic framework. National Administrative Department of Statistics in Colombia, DANE, recognized the importance of using geospatial data and services in disaster risk management for supporting all phases of the disaster risk management before, during, and post disasters, enriching the informed decision process of policy and decision makers and also of all actors involved in planning, risk reduction, response, and recovery. DANE, as the statistical authority in Colombia, gives guidelines to use geospatial data and the national geostatistical framework produced and maintained by the entity, established as the spatial reference for the development of the statistical process by national statistical system members which are in charge of producing and disseminating the official statistical information in Colombia. For supporting the operationalization of the statistical framework on geospatial information and services for disasters at national level, DANE and other member states of the UNGGIM America Disaster Working Group are developing the priority area number one, governance and policies through the conceptualization of a governance model of geospatial information management for disasters. This value proposition considers the principle of the global statistical geospatial framework and the strategic pathways of the integrated geospatial information framework, and is based on the improvement in the articulation among national entities responsible of disaster risk management statistics and mappings and their systems and infrastructures. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, my first question goes to countries' representatives. Uh, Alain, I have a specific question for you. So I will start uh, uh, maybe by, with uh, Mr. Fujiruma. What is the level of use of GIS and the services in the disaster risk management in your respective countries? 
Okay, How thank you? you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, regarding disaster risk management, I we think again that uh, the the level of situational awareness is more important uh, than the level of the use of GIS. So we concentrate uh, on providing uh, situation data in the form of web maps, and our challenge is that. Uh, we can make the service uh, itself resilient and sustainable, and of course, uh, usable with the GIS. So I think our service is uh, consumable by GIS expert, but uh, with, even without GIS, uh, our data will be uh, available. That is what I think I'm thinking about. Thank you. Thank you All very right much. Ms. Chang? Yeah. Okay. Mm. In recent years, governments and enterprises at all levels in China have continuously increased their science and technology investment in GIS and DRM. A number of important achievements have been made, including satellite launches, Beidou navigation and positioning, airborne radar mapping, large-scale remote sensing data processing, and geospatial information public services, and etc. The Technology Innovation Center of Emergency Survey and Mapping, which where I work, has, all, has also developed, developed key technologies research around data acquisition under complex terrain and extreme weather. Emergency command and dispatch, geological disaster monitoring and early warning, and the rapid interpretation and assessment of disasters based on machine learning. At present time, China's emergency survey and mapping support work has been incorporated into the National Emergency Response System and have established a joint response mechanism with DRM organizations. Take Sichuan province as an example. Once the disaster occurs, Sichuan Bureau of Survey Mapping and Joint Information will start the emergency response pre-plan and send a technical team working closely with Sichuan Emergency Management Department based on their request to provide, to provide data and technical support for emergency rescue and command decision making. Uh, thank you, Tasma. I hope I have answered the question. Thank you very Thank much, you. Ms. Chang. Uh, next, Maria Correa, over you. Thank you. Uh, as part of the national policy of disaster risk management in Colombia, established through the law 1523 of 2012, the National Plan for Disaster Risk Management tackles the consolidation of the national policy of geographic information and the national spatial data infrastructure. In that sense, national entities broadly implement geospatial policies and standards given by the national spatial data infrastructure under the lead of the National Mapping Agency called Instituto Geográfico Agustín Codazzi. On the other hand, the National Statistical, uh, the Statistical Framework produced by DANE as the special reference for developing the statistical operations of the Colombian National Statistical System in all phases of the statistical process aims the geographic disaggregation of official statistics. There are good examples of using geospatial data for preparedness and risk reduction, such as the national model of seismic threat developed by the Colombian Geological Service in collaboration with the Global Earthquake Model Foundation. However, the need for up-to-date disaggregate geospatial information is evident, and therefore it is important to explore alternative data sources such as big data to generate real-time geospatial information and services for disaster risk management. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my next, my question goes to uh, Mr. Alan Mills. So I have a specific question for you. Uh, you know that humanitarian mapping is increasingly an important part of emergency activities. Uh, can you tell us about the role of the humanitarian mapping in decision making during emergency? 
for sure, I saw that you receive is that you have some uh, a huge experience working with small island state. Uh, certainly, if you can touch that, it will be very interesting because uh, some participants are uh, from those areas. Thank you very much. Yes, so indeed. The um, model for our response uh, does not vary that much because of the, the sort of timeline that you have of an emergency response. And we can use the Haiti example at the moment, the recent earthquake there, in that the first stages of the response, you're trying to find out where it's been affected, how many people have been affected, what kind of basic infrastructure overall has been damaged. And as time goes on, then you're, you're going through search and rescue very immediately. And then you're going on to understanding what the needs of those people who are have been made homeless. They need shelter, they need water, food, medicines, and such like. And then as time goes on, more sophisticated elements of the humanitarian model come in uh, to ensure that the health services are back up and running, that the, um, the more nuanced uh, support to, uh, to the response comes in, things like uh, protection of individuals, special services for people with disabilities, old age people, uh, maybe people with uh, uh, women with uh, pregnancy. Um, and then it, it goes into agricultural damage, infrastructure damage, and then we look at early recovery. So there's this general phase in any type of uh, sudden onset emergency that has that same sort of sequence. So we really need data up front to be able to understand what was there before the event happens. And that's where the national data sets come in and are incredibly important to those. What we find is if we don't have access to those data sets that are well curated and kept up to date by the national agencies, we go elsewhere. And that's where people like OpenStreetMap, um, other initiatives that are out there um, that are providing data, remote sensing sources and such like, we rely on them for getting that baseline information. But we also need systems in place then that when the emergency has happened, that we're cataloging the information about how many people have been affected, what agencies are working on the ground, uh, all that needs to be pulled in. So I'm, I'm really keen to see the development of this local responders uh, database as well in the system. So I think, you know, we should be targeting the SGD, uh, sorry, the SF uh, and the IGIF towards making sure that the data are available that help before the emergency happens, but then also have the frameworks in place that everybody is contributing to in a standardized way. Uh, in, in the actual event of, of, a, of a disaster. And increasingly, my final point here is that it should link to both the anticipatory action that I was talking about, so what action can take place beforehand, and understanding the disaster risk profiles beforehand. Because if you know that, you have the strategy in place to be able to respond better when the emergency happens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Simone, I know that we are uh, behind our agenda. Can you continue with one more question? Do you have enough time for that? Uh, one last one. Okay, Mary. thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So uh, my last question is, uh, what solutions and strategies your country deployed regarding the five priority areas for sure for uh, uh for alan you can go with the experience that you have uh you know regarding the human humanitarian mapping or work with uh, uh you know other countries so uh, in general i want to know what is the lesson you learned during this process i think it is very important uh, to share uh, these experiences with countries that are in the process of implementing the priority areas mm -hmm. so over you mr fujirima yeah thank you again uh, uh, yes, yes, yes thank you so much <laughs> yeah no problem uh dr sabo and uh, yes uh, our strategy or solution is actually following uh, your example by the national resources canada uh yes uh, uh that is uh, yes yes our solution and the strategy is to use the open source software and uh, yes uh in a end-to-end -end manner uh, in our organization our service uh, can be consumed using proprietary GIS or open source GIS, but our service itself is implemented by open source software end to end. By doing so, we feel that uh, we are doing uh, good in most of the priority areas, uh, especially governance, data management, common infrastructure, common services, and uh, yes, uh, uh, 
last uh, but not at the least, uh, financial resources. Instead, uh, yes, our challenge is capacity building uh, because yes, uh, open source uh, uh, use of open source or even developing or management open source is uh, not so uh, easy. Uh, Okay, yes, but I believe that the capacity building is a really constructive challenge. And so uh, we are looking forward uh, to working with uh, all of you in our working group disaster to yes, uh, collaborate in, yeah, uh, sorry, capacity building, especially in open source software. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Fujimura. Over you, Alan Mills. Thank you very much. I've got four quick points that I think are really important for taking this assessment process forward. One is that use end use cases like Nick McWilliam uh, presented here. Let's have some understanding, not just about whether we think we've got data in the right state of maturity and we have all the frameworks, but can we provide evidence of how this is being used in disaster? The second one is the nuance of quality. I think, you know, Simone, you gave a great understanding of the number of places that have got good maturity in their view about various uh, tools and, and, and instruments that they're putting forward. But let's look at what is the quality of their responder database. Are they reaching out to civil society as well as their own national agencies? Third point is, um, I think those countries that we weren't able to cover in there, what extra support can we give to be able to reach out to them, find out? Because they're obviously some of the countries that are in the most need of better use of geographic information. Um, and finally, I think, you know, all the points we're discussing here, I think they're going to help Hidanori and I when we're developing the simulation later in the year. Uh, these are the kinds of things that I think we can dig into more deeply and discuss in future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Chang, over you. Thank you. Um, to implement the strategic framework, and China has conducted a national emergency survey and a mapping capacity building. And through this capacity building, um, the GIS data resources have been greatly enhanced. And um, also technical equipment and the distressing of the talent team has also been significant improved. Um, from the national from national to provincial level, um, a fundamental geospatial information database and a high precision geological disaster prevention database has been have been established. And the a national and provincial geospatial information public service platform has uh, has also been established, providing providing the society and the public with standard and unified online map services. Also. Um, the national and the provincial mapping agencies all, um, also set up uh, emergency surveying and uh, mapping centers to um, equip equipment with cloud store and um, infrastructures and uh, add some systems of rapid data processing, map imprinting, data management, and etc. With this common infrastructure, uh, we have the ability to provide joint information and services for disasters. Uh, as for regarding the, the challenges, I think the biggest challenge is the issue of data sharing. On the one hand, it is the request of promoting the social application of high quality joint information data. And on the other hand, it is the request of data security. So this is a contradiction. So necessary, necessary data sharing mechanism needs to be further improved. Meanwhile, the technical support capabilities of information transmission and network security also needs to be enhanced. Another challenge is the integration of GIS data with industry thematic data, such as uh, statistical, geological, meteorological, and environmental protection, etc. At this present time, these data are managed by the respective industries. They, they are relatively isolated and there is no interconnection. So further integration is needed to join, jointly serve disaster risk management. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Maria, Cor uh, Maria Correa, over to you, please. Thank you. The main challenge faced to implement the strategic framework is related to the establishment of an organization that oversees the implementation of its five priorities for actions. 
In Colombia, the National Unit for Disaster Risk Management leads the National System for Disaster Risk Management, created under the law, the law mentioned before. Nevertheless, as the strategic framework is more a recommendation and non-mandatory, it is not clear legally which entity at the national level has the responsibility to lead the implementation of, of this strategic framework. Another challenge is the in the implementation of the strategic framework is related to achieve a more actively engagement among community and institutions to complement and align these, their data sets and collaborative. In addition, funding support for the activities in the implementation of the strategic framework is also necessary. Uh, as a strategy for achieving the priority area one, governance and policy, DANE, as member of the UNGGIM America Disaster Working Group, is working jointly with its members in the conceptualization of the governance model of geospatial data management for disasters based on the interinstitutional articulation among national agencies and also their own geospatial and disaster risk management systems and infrastructures. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, thank you very much to all panelists. So I hope uh, the provided information will be very useful for mm -hmm. all countries that are in the process of implementing uh, this framework. Thank you very much. Back to you, Simon. Back to Michelle. Michelle, we're handing back over to you. Thank you. I think based on the time, we're going to have to make the, the okay. discussion segment very short. If there are any pertinent burning questions that persons have that we can address, whether it be a presentation or the panel discussion, and then for us to hand over to Mr. Oki. Thank you. Okay. We will just thank you, Simone. We will just allow for um, for one one um, one one inclusion. Sorry, one one statement in the discussion se se section. Um, we had um, really really very useful and beneficial inputs um, from the panelists and from the presenters. A lot of food for thought. And so if anybody wants to make any um, comment at this time, I'll just wait for one minute. And then if not, we'll move to the next agenda item. OK. Um, it looks like we don't have any takers right now, but um, the, I do believe that this should be something that we explore um, maybe a little later on in terms of um, opening back up this section of the side event in another format, um, in another way, maybe just a general meeting for us to, you know, really have, um, you know, hear from other persons um, what was presented and uh, your own experiences and how we can make um, everything work together. So I would like to just move to the next agenda item, and that is the closing remarks. Mr. Oki, our Japan co-chair and director general, the Planning Department of Geospatial Information Authority, Japan. Hi, thank, thank you, Michelle. Uh, uh, dear everyone, uh, thank you very much for participating in this side event today. The success of the side event was made possible with the cooperation with all participants, despite the difficult situation of having hold it a battery due to COVID-19. I'd like to acknowledge the strong leadership and uh, continuous contribution of co-chair Jamaica in organizing this uh, side event. Also, I'd like to make, uh, make thank you uh, the pre presenters, panelists, and moderators for the useful and clear explanations. 
and lively discussions, as well as the secretariat and others for their support. We would like to use the comment from participants in future working group activities. In agenda item 10 of the UNGJIM session on 24th of August, we will also report on the activities of the working group disasters during the intersessional period. And we would appreciate your continued support and advice. Thank you very much for your time today. I look forward to seeing you, you all again soon. And thank you again for all participants. Uh, back to uh, Mitchell, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Oki, for your closing remarks and your kind comments. Um, so, colleagues, um, we are now at the end of our side event, and um, it is now time for the vote of thanks. And I think that we can be very happy, very satisfied with um, the time spent today, um, with all that we have been able to share with each other, um, with all of the experiences that have that we have um, articulated here in this space, and uh, for all of the recommendations that have come forth out of the um, the various discussions that we have had on the panel presentations and on the um, <clears throat> presenters, the presentation from the presenters. So. The only thing left for me to say is thank you. Thank you. A big thank you to our presenters, our three presenters um, who took us through from the, the genesis of the um, strategic framework up to case studies as to how we can um, look at, you know, the work that we're doing and how it really makes an impact on the ground. Um, I'd like to also say a big thank you to the panelists. Um, your experience and your presentations invaluable. And um, you know, I am so interested that I, 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 after next week when we would have had our meeting, then you know it will be getting back to um, working and uh, trying to you know bring this uh, gathering back together so that we can continue this discussion, because this discussion is an important one. Um, feedback is important for how we strengthen what it is that we do in going forward. I would like to also say thank you to our panelists moderator, Dr. Um, Sabo. Um, it is nice to meet you. And, um, you know, we just want to continue to say to, we just hope that you will continue to be with us as we roll out this um, initiative to the Secretariat, I must say a big thank you to all of your support. Uh, a big thank you to all of your contributions and your invaluable support. Thank you very much. And so to everyone, I just want to wish you um, a wonderful rest of your day, your evening, and your afternoon. And thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye. Uh, thank you, everyone. Please thank appreciate. You. Goodbye. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could we get a group photo, please? Thank you. Could we turn on all? Okay. Oh, we'll be Mark, very quick. Everybody, turn on their cameras as long as you can, so that we get a group photo. Could you stop sharing screen, please, Taro? And let's see if we could get a. Get a photo before okay, everybody. Okay, I, I stopped the share screen and let, let's see. Okay. Okay. Can we turn on our cameras, please? Mm. We want to take a few snaps. Please, please, please. Okay. I think that should be Thanks. it. Thank you so much. All right. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, too.